Okay, well, uh, let, me, uh, let me go ahead and introduce um, Allison Smithson. Allison is a student at Coastal, uh, like we did on campus is whenever we had our speaker programs, we always try to have Coastal students involved. And um, Allison is actually taking uh, the Great Decisions class that we offer. It's an online class and it runs eight weeks and it covers these four topics, but then we also cover the other four topics uh, that are in the textbook. So, so Allison is actually taking that course for credit. Uh, this year. So um, Allison uh, Smithson is a senior uh, sociology major with a specialization in criminology. Uh, she is also a political science um, uh, minor in her program. Uh, she's from Issaquah, Washington, the state of Washington. Um, and um, she, again, is, uh, is actively involved in her program. I've really appreciated uh, Allison's input to, uh, to the Great Decisions program. So Allison, I'm going to go ahead and, uh, and let you uh, do, uh, do my introduction since I am the speaker today. So Hopefully you can unmute yourself. There you are. Good morning, everybody. And thank you for that, Dr. Kilroy. Um, so our speaker today is Dr. Richard Kilroy. He is an associate professor in the Department of Politics at Coastal Carolina University in Conway, South Carolina, where he teaches courses in support of the Intelligence and National Security Studies degree program in Latin America and North American Regional Studies. He is also a former <laughs> intelligence in Latin America foreign area officer. He holds an MA and PhD in Foreign Affairs from the University of Virginia. Dr. Kilroy is co-author of Seguridad Regional in America del Norte, Una Relacion Impugnada, co-author of Introduction to Intelligence, Institutions, Operations, and Analysis, editor of Threats to Homeland Security, Reassuring the All Hazards Perspective, co-author of North American Regional Security, a Trilateral Framework, and co-editor of Colonial Disputes and Territorial Legacies in Africa and Latin America. He has also published articles in journals such as Journal of Public Affairs, Publius, the Journal of Federalism, Contemporary Security Policy, Homeland Security Affairs, Journal of Strategic Security, Global Security and Intelligence Studies, and the Journal of Policing, Intelligence and Counterterrorism. Dr. Kilroy is also a non-resident fellow in Rice University's Baker Institute for Public Policy, Center for, Center for the United States of Mexico and Mexico. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Allison. Appreciate that. Okay, so um, again, as I mentioned to you, I'm not, again, an, a, an expert in the Arctic region. Again, we, we, we covered in my Homeland Security class. It's an area of environmental security that we talk about, um, and it is an area that we, we do a case study on with our students. And typically, when I do the capstone sessions, I get uh, at least a couple of students every year who want to write about Arctic security, so I've had a chance to, to, to be able to work with them on, on this particular topic. Uh, but, but it is a very pertinent topic, obviously, to, to understand what's going on globally, uh, but it is a region sometimes that we, we tend to neglect because we don't think of it necessarily as a, as a region as we do in terms of other geographic regions like, like Europe or Latin America or Asia Pacific, things like that. So what I want to do is I want to kind of go through an overview, obviously just talk about what, what is the Arctic, what do we really mean by the Arctic, um, and then talk a little bit about the history or context. Uh, many of you are, uh, like me, a cold warrior or, or you know, went through that time frame. Uh, our students don't, don't know the context, but uh, it's important to understand uh, the importance of the Arctic during, uh, during the Cold War in that period. And then we'll compare it to you know, the Antarctic and uh, you know, why, why are things different in terms of uh, some of the security cooperation issues there versus uh, in the Arctic? What, what makes that region a little bit different than the Arctic area? I do want to talk about climate change because that is, is kind of what's driving this issue as obviously a security issue. Uh, and give more background on that. Uh, like I said, it, it's part of a broader topic of what I call environmental security. And it's not just uh, obviously the Arctic that's being impacted. This is a global phenomenon, but I think we're seeing those impacts probably more, uh, more seriously and, and probably uh, you know, at least in terms of you know, speeding up the impacts uh, happening in the Arctic maybe than, than maybe in some other areas and, and kind of why that's driving it. And one of the big areas is obviously you know, how that's impacting access to resources uh, competition, uh, great power competition reemerging in the Arctic. And we'll look at some specific state interest. Uh, obviously, you know, uh, we'll focus on the United States, but I do want to talk a little bit about, you know, what Russia's interests are, China, and of course, Canada as being an Arctic country as well. And then we'll look at kind of, you know, where we are in terms of policies, you know, what has the U.S. done, what hasn't it done, uh, and, uh, and compare some of the, uh, the different policies and strategies towards the Arctic region, uh, and then just, just wrap up with some final comments. So first off, 
what is the Arctic? Um, this was actually a Jeopardy question just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and uh, they actually asked, you know, what, is, what does the word Arctic mean? And it does come from the, from the Greek word for, for bear. And we think about obviously polar bears and, and the Arctic region in particular. But what's interesting when you think about it in terms of the size of the region, um, when you look at what we call the Arctic region as the area within the Arctic Circle, uh, it would be at the equivalent of about one sixth of the Earth's landmass. So, so it is a very large region. Uh, and what's becoming what, uh, and again, the challenge now is it's becoming more accessible as a region, whereas in the past it was predominantly covered with ice pack, ice flows, and, and now it's becoming more of a blue uh, water region than a white water region. Uh, covers the entire globe, 24 time spans. Uh, there are eight countries that, uh, that are impact that are directly bordered on the Arctic Circle region. Uh, and then there's 13 observer countries, and we'll talk about that. Um, but it is a region still of extreme temperature and weather and an area where we do see these, uh, these permafrost fields, glacier fields, but this is where the impact uh, of climate change is really, uh, you know, kind of exacerbating that and speeding up a lot of the, um, uh, you know, a lot of the, the changes that are taking place in the region. Um, something to keep in mind. Um, this is, uh, I'm sorry, the, 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 again, the image is not too great. I actually photocopied, I took it out of the article in, in the Great Decisions book, but um, what it shows is that this is really a, a kind of a region of regions. And there are two different regions in the Arctic. And one is what we consider to be the European Arctic. And that is along the lines of the Northern Sea Route. And in the map, you can see that, that's the dotted line that goes up uh, to the North and around, particularly around Russia, uh, extending you know, from Russia via Norway and so on. Within that area is, uh, you know, is a large population area of, uh, you have a major city of Murmansk in Russia, about 300,000 people, um, and also a very large area for Russian military operations along the Kola Peninsula uh, in that region. Um, so that's becoming more accessible with these, again, the changes that we're seeing in the Arctic, and that's where some of the competition over where the resources are taking place and claims to different parts of the Arctic by, by countries. Uh, so you have the, the European Arctic, and then you also have the North, Atlant uh, North American Arctic, uh, which we're probably more familiar with, which involves, of course, the Canada and the United States uh, and the, the, the Northwest Passage. Um, and that, again, that has uh, changed because of the change in the, uh, in the, you know, the climate areas, making that more accessible to commercial transit, uh, making areas, particularly on Canada's, uh, you know, the islands up in the, uh, the, in the northern part of Canada, more accessible as well. Um, and it's not as, uh, as populated as the Russian Arctic region is. Uh, when you think about you know, the largest city up there would be Nuke in Greenland, and that's only about 17,000. Again, a very sparsely populated area, a lot of the, uh, the First Nations people in that area as well. Okay, so again, this is another graphic that I did take out of the, uh, the article in the textbook. But, but what this shows is that there, there are so many competing claims to this region right now. Um, and it's simply because, again, as these areas become more accessible to primarily for the resources, uh, we see countries making claims, primarily trying to access fishing rights, uh, looking at potential oil reserves. And those two passages are major transit rights now for, uh, for, tra for vehicles transiting uh, through the uh, uh, Arctic region. And there's actually now almost a third region where now because of the ice melt, uh, you can actually transit almost directly across the Arctic at certain times of the year. Uh, and have access that way as well. Um, what, what, you know, what the countries are competing over in a lot of cases is what we call this, this 200 nautical mile exclusive economic zone. And, and this is a claim uh, that comes out of the, uh, the United Nations Convention on Law of the Sea, uh, where countries have been able to claim act, uh, you know, exclusive rights to mineral resources, fishing rights in, uh, in that area. Now, this is different than what we call the territorial sea. That's 12 nautical miles off of the coast uh, of all countries. And, and that's uh, typically considered to be sovereign territory, meaning uh, you cannot access those you know, fishing rights and so on because of that and transit those. We, you know, ships aren't allowed to, to transit those areas, obviously, without permission, uh, particularly keeping military vessels and things like that out of your territorial sea. They can access, in this case, or transit through the, uh, the 200 nautical mile uh, EEZ zone. So there's been some competition and some claims over that because of the continental shelf in particular. And there is a, a commission on the limits of the continental shelf, that's the UNCLOS, the UNCLCS, as paired to the UNCLOS, uh, but that is basically the enforcement mechanism where countries, if they have a, a dispute on areas related to the continental shelf, uh, can go to the United Nations and try to get that adjudicated. Uh, because in some cases, uh, you know, the continental shelf typically would extend out maybe 100, 200 nautical miles from the coast of a country. 
Uh, in some areas, it extends much further. And as a result, these countries have tried to make claim to a much longer area. And the UN has adjudicated in some cases to allow that uh, somewhere is out to maybe 350 nautical miles in some case. Uh, so, so as a result, there's you can read these uh, number of claims you can see here on the map uh, between countries and between countries you know, that are part of the Arctic Council in particular. Uh, but this is, again, this is going to be a continually, uh, you know, contested area. Part of the problem for the United States is that we are not a signatory to the, uh, the UN Law of the Sea Convention. Uh, that was ratified in 1994. Um, we are one of three countries that has not uh, been a signatory to that. And, and that really kind of goes back to some of the, the debates that were going on back in the 70s, 80s, something called the North-South debate. It was primarily over, you know, the wealthy countries and the developing countries and access to resources. Somebody else getting in. There we go. And, uh, and so as a result, the U.S. doesn't necessarily have a seat at the table in some of these negotiations, particularly when it comes to the continental shelf discussions and so on. And so that, uh, that has caused a problem for the United States. And it's always been an area where um, uh, you know, different administrations have said we need to be involved with it uh, because uh, it's, it's um, keeping us out of many of these areas where, again, uh, we see these competing claims go on. And, and we have those claims as well. The United States uh, has claims because of Alaska and our coastline up in the Arctic region. So talk about the Cold War context. And, uh, and as I said, many, many of us have lived through that. Um, and so the Arctic was, a, was an area of, of competition. Uh, it was concern, especially uh, the you know, fear over if there was actually World War III, um, where um, you know, the attacks would come from. If, you know, it was you know, obviously the shortest distance you know, between the Soviet Union and the United States coming you know, over the Arctic Circle. Uh, and the concern was over long range bombers like the bear bombers, but also then we got into the, you know, the capabilities of intercontinental ballistic missiles and so on. Uh, so uh, we created something called NORAD in 1957, and that's uh, the North American Aerospace uh, Defense Command. Uh, NORAD is a joint command uh, of the United States and Canada. It is uh, still based out of Peterson Air Force Base. Uh, I've had a chance to get out there and be part of, you know, go into Cheyenne Mountain and see the command center out there. Uh, so that still exists. Uh, the only change was that after 9-11, um, we put it under uh, U.S. Northern Command. And so it is part of uh, that, uh, that new command that took place that was created after 9-11 after as, as a regional command. Uh, but it's still a binational command. Uh, the commander of NORAD uh, is actually dual-hatted. Uh, he's also the commander of NORTHCOM. And uh, the Canadian deputy commander of NORAD um, is actually in that chain of command and, and has relationships. And there, there's kind of this, this binational staff that takes place with NORAD, but then with NORTHCOM, it's not. So it, it causes some, some conflicts of time and understanding uh, errors of responsibility. Uh, but what a lot of people don't realize is that actually on 9-11, uh, on the attacks that day, uh, when we literally shut everything down uh, in terms of air traffic in the United States, um, our defense uh, of the continental United States was being run by the Canadian uh, deputy commander because the U.S. commander at the time uh, was not at uh, the NATO at uh, NORAD headquarters. And so it was actually being run by, uh, by the Canadians uh, who were providing for our defense of, of the continental United States during after right after 9-11. Uh, so NORAD is, is still in existence. It's been around, uh, you know, since the 50s, uh, but it is still very much integrated into our, uh, our, our security uh, system that we have in place here. Um, it's interesting also uh, in, uh, in 62, I'm, I wanna share this one. This is a little bit of a side for somebody who teaches intelligence studies. So I, I wanted to throw this out there. Um, there was an operation, it was called Operation Cold Feet. It wasn't well known, uh, but this was actually a CIA run operation uh, in the Arctic. And it was to collect against the, the Soviet Union to find out what they were doing in the Arctic in terms of scientific exploration, you know, security, were they building military bases in the region? And so uh, we, we literally dropped two uh, U.S. military officers working for the CIA at the time uh, into, into the Arctic region. And uh, they were actually collected uh, quite a bit of intelligence information uh, and then went into some of these base camps and things that the, the Soviets had set up in the Arctic. But the only way to get them out was actually to uh, use something called the Fulton Skyhook. And that's what you see in the picture right there. It's, it's basically a B-17 uh, that's uh, configured to allow them to basically be able to extract uh, people from remote areas where you can't land aircraft. 
And, and that's how they were able to get them out. They actually got both men back safely as a result of that. And if, uh, if you guys are James Bond fans, you might have actually seen them actually use that in one of the James Bond movies where they literally take, you know, picks and they fly them. They, they, they capture the, the balloons up there and they're able to capture the, the, uh, the line and, and bring the people uh, back to safety. It was a pretty, pretty scary thing for them. But, uh, but th this was the extent at which we were concerned. Obviously, it was happening in the Arctic that we were uh, we wanted to get some intelligence. We didn't have access to a lot of these areas because of the remoteness, because of the ice, and because of uh, the lack of access from either shipping or, or even from, from aircraft at that time. Um, we had something that we set up in the, in the 1950s. It was called, uh, called the Dew Line. It was the Distant Early Warning Line or Distant Early Warning System. Uh, the article in the book calls it um, the Defense Early Warning System. It's actually Distant Early Warning System. And uh, this was, uh, again, set up with, with Canada and extended uh, across the northern part of the United States and Alaska, Canada, and also into, into Greenland. And uh, this is where we set up a series of, um, um, we had a number of these um, uh, aerodromes uh, and also phased array radar sites. That's what the picture in the bottom is down there. Um, and that was to basically to provide early warning alert of, of a Soviet missile attack um, or bombers flying across so we could scramble jets to intercept them. Uh, because we were obviously concerned about the Arctic as an approach, in this case, a strategic approach uh, to, uh, to the United States. And so, so the dew line existed for, for many, many years. Um, and then in 1985, it was actually switched over. In this case, it was called the North Warning System. And uh, that's where, we're, again, we maintain it was six, 63 of these, these radomes, uh, phased array radar sites. And they actually uh, began closing those at the end of the Cold War. Uh, by 1993, most of them were, shel were sheltered. Um, they were uh, gone to unmanned sites, uh, which are most of them now. But what that led to is there was a lot of environmental damage and things when they started doing the cleanup from these sites. Uh, and as a result, there's obviously some impact on the, the Inuit and some of the, the First Nations peoples up in these, these remote areas uh, where we have these sites located. Um, interestingly enough, uh, Gorbachev actually took an initiative before the Cold War ended uh, to try to demilitarize uh, the Arctic to, to prevent a possible confrontation in that region. It was called the Murmansk Initiative, and it was to promote scientific um, cooperation, security cooperation, uh, even economic cooperation up into, into, the, Atlantic, into the, the Arctic region. Um, and that was part of perestroika and you know, the glasnost and some of the other uh, things that uh, Gorbachev was proposing at the time. A lot of it was being driven by economic reasons. The, the Soviet Union was imploding and, and they realized they just couldn't maintain a lot of their, um, you know, their, their military capability up in that region. Their military was, was, was um, you know, impacted quite heavily uh, by the economic uh, time. So this was a way for them uh, to, to try to divert you know, concerns they had for their security by, by proposing this, this new initiative. But, uh, but again, this was a, this was a region of, of, it was very heavily contested, obviously, during the Cold War. And uh, in fact, uh, we're going to talk about kind of where that's going today uh, and in terms of some recent developments. Now, I, I do want to contrast uh, the, the Arctic with the Antarctic. And, and a lot of people, um, they think of the two regions as being similar in terms of, of obviously climate, uh, remoteness, things like that. But the key difference, obviously, is that the Antarctic is a continent. It actually is, is a land uh, you know, a, a land-based area in, in the south compared to the Arctic, which is just ice and it's not a, a land feature. And so as a result, early on during the Cold War, there was a basic agreement not to militarize the, the Antarctic. Um, and so this agreement, this peace treaty was signed in 1961 uh, to try to prevent this from being an area of contest between the superpowers. And, and one of the reasons why that was successful is because obviously the remoteness of the Antarctic compared to the Arctic uh, the fact that our countries didn't border that area. Uh, there are other countries that do. And so we set up uh, basically a demilitarized zone in the Antarctic. Uh, we, we kept it free of nuclear tests and any type of, of positive radioactive waste and so on. And that's what you see today is you see a, a number of these scientific um, exchanges going on between countries uh, in the Antarctic. And it was, a, again, we kind of were able to set aside some of the, these territorial disputes of countries who were trying to extend their their area of interest into, into the Antarctic regions. That's been, been fairly successful uh, for, for obviously for a number of years. Uh, I think that again, as we see more climate change and more access to some of these areas become um, 
in this case, uh, maybe leading to maybe more contested uh, relations in that region as well. But for the most part, uh, what we have in the Antarctic, we've not been able to, to replicate in the Arctic. Uh, simply because, again, the difference of the, the geography and difference of the terrain and so on. But there are people who kind of throw out, you know, is there a way to propose like a, you know, an Arctic peace treaty uh, like we have with the Antarctic uh, region? Okay, so when the Cold War ended, um, this was an area where there was, uh, there was an agreement that uh, the countries who bordered on uh, the Arctic region uh, could come together and basically, you know, put together a, a forum. It's not, an, it's not a formal international organization. There's no voting rights and things like that. It's basically a forum for discussion. Uh, but it was to bring all the countries that had interest, direct interest in the Arctic region together. And so in 1996, the Arctic Council was formed. Um, it was called the Ottawa Declaration. Um, and this was, uh, again, the eight countries. There were 13 observer countries as well uh, to that agreement. But primarily what it was, again, was to um, look at, at scientific inquiry, to look at economic interests. Um, indigenous rights was a big topic that a lot, especially Canada was concerned with at the time. Uh, environmental changes. Let me get some of this here. I think some folks are kind of getting dropped out and trying to get back in. So, um, But what's interesting is uh, it, it didn't really talk about military security. The Arctic Council was not meant to be a forum for discussing uh, military security in the Arctic region. Uh, its headquarters is in Tromso in, in Norway, and they have a rotating leadership between the, the countries uh, uh, that are a part of the Arctic Council. So right now it's Iceland, uh, but their, their two-year term is up next year, and uh, the Russian Federation will take over. And so that does cause some concern about, you know, will there be a movement uh, away from the traditional role and mission of the Arctic Council under, under Russia's leadership when they take over. Okay, so let's transition and talk about you know why why we're focusing on the Arctic and what are some of the um, the implications of what's happening globally and, and why this region in particular. And I do want to talk a little bit about the climate change. And th there's always kind of this debate between um, the you know the, the the scientific community and others who uh, don't necessarily see the same causes for what we're seeing or why why climate change is occurring. And the two major schools of thought are what we call the anthropogenic or kind of the man-made effect of climate change versus something that's happening naturally, the naturogenic. And so this, is, uh, this has been a debate uh, within scientific communities. I think the science was pretty much on the side of the, the anthrop anthropomorphic side. It seems more like the policy makers and the politicians are lining more on the other side. But there, there's been this idea of, you know, what is actually behind climate change and maybe what's exacerbating it. And I think with the uh, with the man-made effects, it uh, really is this idea that it has been accelerating uh, because of, of climate change and we're seeing global warming, the impact of that. The idea though, which is kind of interesting is that's not anything new. That actually goes back to the 19th century by this gentleman, uh, Savante Arrhenius. Uh, he was actually, he's a Swedish uh, uh, scientist uh, who, who studied this phenomenon and uh, proposed the idea that even uh, in, the, in the late 1800s, the 1890s, uh, that we were seeing global warming occurring, climate change was occurring, and that there was a human uh, contribution. It was coming from human industry development was contributing to that. Um, the intelligence community also has uh, concern about that. The CIA in the 1970s were actually looking at the security implications of climate change. Um, and they were very concerned that this was going to create a number of destabilizing effects uh, throughout the world. Uh, not so much debating on what was causing it, but what were the effects that it was having, particularly as it related to national security? And there, and there was some concern about, you know, the uh, things we call environmental modification, you know, things that, that states would do to cause climate change or actually to uh, have a, uh, you know, an effect on the climate. And, and I know some of you were Vietnam era veterans and might actually remember Operation Popeye, uh, which was a cloud seed, uh, seeding operation done uh, by the U.S. military in, in South Asia. Uh, to, to do environmental modification during monsoon season to actually increase the monsoon season by doing cloud seeding. And uh, the intent was to cause more rain to you know, uh, affect the, you know, the, the mobility of the uh, you know, Viet Cong and the Ho Chi Minh Trail and, and washing out the trail and things like that. Um, and it actually had uh, some, some very negative impacts, obviously, on, on the countries throughout that region. Uh, and so there was even been, so there, there was some question on whether it actually really accomplished what, uh, what they had hoped to accomplish during the time. But, but it did raise the concern that uh, this, this, was, uh, this is something countries could do. And so there was a United Nations convention that came out after that 
uh, after the Vietnam War about, uh, about environmental modification and countries signed on an agreement not, not to do things like that in the future. Um, in the 90s, the Senate Armed Services Committee actually again explored this issue about environmental destruction and how that was gonna have an effect, particularly on national security. And what they were looking at particularly were issues related to the you know, climate warming facilities, the propagation bacteria, disease, things like that. Also the higher temperatures that would lead to drought in certain regions of the world. And of course in the Arctic region, what would be the impact on the polar ice cap melting that would increase maybe flooding and also some of the other problems we've seen about the disputes and uh, contested areas in that particular region. Um, the United Nations formed something in 1995. This was called the, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the um, IPCC. Uh, this was, again, it was meant to be an international body that looked at this problem globally of what was happening and the impact on climate change on countries. Um, the Pentagon also did a study in 2003. Uh, they were concerned about it from a military standpoint, uh, again, about how it was gonna affect the, uh, the ability of the military to deploy. Uh, particularly regions that were impacted by climate change, if there were countries actually uh, having resource wars or things over food, over water. Uh, but it really was a concern that the, what was happening with this idea of climate change was having kind of an, what we call an accelerator effect, what we call secondary tertiary effects. And as a result, you could see things like increased possibilities of terrorism in states competing if there were, again, food resources or drought or things that would actually cause uh, conflict within those particular states that terrorist groups could, could take advantage of over those governments. So, so this was an ongoing concern uh, in, in the Department of Defense in particular. And we actually had a, a climate change and national security conference. I was teaching at East Carolina at the time, uh, and this was at Chapel Hill. And it was actually sponsored by University of North Carolina Chapel Hill and the Army War College. And, and this brought together, again, a number of academic practitioners and others uh, to look at this issue of climate change and how it would have an impact on, on, on issues related to national security. In fact, one of our speakers was H.R. McMaster. Some of you might remember him as the former national security advisor under President Trump. Uh, but it really did kind of highlight it again, these concerns that the military had to uh, be aware of. You know, getting beyond the, the politics of climate change, it was we need to deal with the effects of climate change. And I spoke about U.S. Southern Command. I had been with Southcom for, uh, for four years before I retired. And uh, that was a big concern about our area of operation in Latin America was obviously the effects of uh, increased um, uh, environmental damage due to climate change. We, we were doing uh, disaster relief exercises, disaster response exercises in the region. Uh, we were obviously concerned about you know, uh, mudslides and flooding and all of the impacts from you know, an increased hurricane season and things like that. Uh, the irony was that uh, we actually had a conference at uh, Soto Cano which is a, an air base we built in Honduras uh, back in the 80s to basically uh, take out the Sandinistas. It was, a, um, a, a, it was an operation done during the Reagan administration that we were basically funding and training and supporting the Contras to overthrow the Sandinistas in Nicaragua. And, and the irony was, you know, here it was, I was at this conference in the 1990s, flying on a Black Hawk helicopter into Soto Cano, sitting next to a Sandinista general uh, who that base was basically set up to, you know, take them out. Uh, back during the 80s. So, so the world had changed and we were suddenly now realizing that disaster response, disaster relief was something a lot of countries in the region, Latin America in particular, uh, were very concerned about. And this was gonna be a growing concern as a result of, again, things related to climate and the changes that were taking place. So the Department of Defense has always been, been interested, uh, concerned about the impact of climate change, uh, particularly when it relates to, to security issues. So the IPCC came out with a report, this was in 2014, and they highlighted the fact that again, this, uh, the climate change was continuing to pose uh, an increasing concern, obviously, to a threat to peace and security. Uh, the projection was that by, by 2050, uh, 1 billion people in the world, again, about, you know, we're about 8 billion now, uh, are going to have some type of water shortages. And, and this was going to exacerbate, again, resource wars. Uh, there's a great book written by Michael Clare. It was actually called Resource Wars. And his argument, again, when he wrote the book a number of years ago was it wasn't, we're not gonna be fighting over oil, we're gonna be fighting over water. And, and that's gonna be the, the, the main resources we're gonna be concerned about in the future. Um, but it also did highlight this fact that uh, again, climate change was again seen as this idea of a threat multiplier, meaning that as a result, you're gonna see a lot more uh, migration, people leaving areas, moving outside of those areas that might become contested areas. Uh, and then you can see an increase in, in political violence, increase in civil wars. And so there was, again, a raising this raising the global concern that climate change was going to have a broader security impact. 
Um, and the concern was that, again, a lot of these countries just don't have the resources. They're not going to be able to respond to, uh, in many cases, the, the effects of what climate change was causing that uh, to be able to respond peacefully. And so there was ra- they were raising the concern the United Nations might see more of a, um, a demand on intervention where uh, states would actually be uh, requesting, in, in this case, not necessarily when we think about peacekeeping forces to separate forces, but in this case, if people were actually um, and suffering under the effects of climate change and migration camps were being set up and these countries couldn't provide support for them, maybe the United Nations would have to do more of these interventions in these countries. And it came under a doctrine called uh, you know, R2P or right to protect, meaning if there were marginalized groups who were being um, you know, impacted negatively by, by the effects of climate change and so on, and governments were not responding to those in those countries, that the United Nations may have to intervene to actually go in and protect uh, marginalized people or people suffering the consequences of these uh, these effects of climate change. And then lastly, they did talk about the impact of how it would have on military forces. Um, there's gonna be a loss of resources. Uh, think about basing rights. I mean, most of our military bases are within the littorals or are close to uh, coastal areas. Uh, I spent my last tour of duty at the Norfolk uh, Naval Base. I was teaching at the Joint Forces Staff College. Uh, if anybody's been to Norfolk, you know that area on Hampton Boulevard floods just in a, you know, a heavy rainstorm. Uh, but if, in fact, you saw the increase of sea rise levels, uh, a good portion of the Norfolk Naval Base is going to be underwater at some point. Um, so there is a very real concern that many of these uh, you know, would, would have direct effects on the military domestically within our own country and how we would deploy, how we could actually get resources into other countries uh, if there was a conflict or someplace that we needed to. Uh, but then also in those countries, what would be the logistics? What would be the, you know, the access to, uh, you know, to runways, to port facilities, to, you know, areas where we would need to conduct military operations? And so there was a real uh, concern that would affect, uh, again, the, the deployments of our military forces to other countries as a result of, uh, of the impact of climate change on those countries. Okay, I do have to talk about this. Um, there, there, I think there is some confusion in, in some people's uh, minds about what is climate change. And, and these are very simplistic definitions, but uh, I share these with our students every year as well. It's just trying to make sure that people understand the distinction between weather and climate. Uh, I think a lot of people, you know, when they when they see that, you know, we're getting uh, 60 degree temperatures in, um, you know, in, in, in uh, January, but it says, oh, climate change is happening because, you know, we have warm weather. And then the, the reverse is, you know, when, it, when it's 20 below zero in Green Bay, Wisconsin, okay, people are saying, hey, where's climate change? It's not happening. We're still freezing up here. Well, it's the distinction between weather and climate. Weather is, as it says here, it's that short-term variation, and, and we see that. You know, we used to jokingly say that, you know, and you, you can uh, in Germany when I lived there, you know, we could get four seasons in one day. You, know, you could have all those four seasons happening because of the weather. Uh, but the climate piece is, is the longer term. It's this idea of looking at this variation over a longer period of time and doing the statistical analysis and doing the scientific research, and this gives us a much better picture of what's happening in a long term. And I think this really came to the fore. If you guys might have remembered this, uh, there was a press conference when President Trump was meeting with Governor Newsom and others out in California. And they were talking about the impact of of wildfires in California. And uh, they were trying to explain to the president that this is a direct impact of of what we're seeing with climate change, increased drought, uh, the the high winds, extreme weather, all those things were contributing to uh, this increase in the amount of wildfires we're seeing there. And, and of course, President Trump responded with his comment about uh, just wait, it'll, just watch, it'll, it'll get cooler. Again, that's a comment about weather. It's not a comment about climate. And I think that's where, again, a lot of people are confused, or at least the policymakers are, are using these distinctions uh, for certain uh, political reasons. But, but I think this is an area that uh, most obviously most scientists and others have come to the conclusion that there is climate change going on. Uh, and it's just the question of what is going to be kind of this long term effect. Uh, that we're going to see in this country and other countries for that matter. And just as an example, this is a snapshot. This came out of the the United Nations World Meteorological Organization. Uh, They put this data together, and this is over a 10-year period, you know, from 2001 to 2010. But what it was showing was that we are seeing an increase in extreme weather. Uh, And the numbers there reflect, uh, you know, the the statistics that we're seeing uh, over that particular time period. Um, and I think you're, you're seeing that visually as well when you see Arctic ice melting, when you see the glacier fields receding, and some of these, uh, you know, direct impacts and uh, of what climate change is happening. I, I tried to I, I tried to get an updated document I, if there was one. You know, since I couldn't find one from the WMO, but I did find another document that I'll share with you a little later on that. Um, in 2016, though, the intelligence community actually put out a national intelligence estimate. Um, these are produced by what's called the um, the National Intelligence Council. 
It's part of what is now the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, the ODNI. Uh, and what these are meant to be are kind of uh, kind of consensus products put out by the different member states of the um, of the United uh, of the intelligence uh, community. And so they actually produced one of these in 2016, and it was looking at the impact of climate change on national security globally. And so what these are meant to NIEs are meant to look out in the future. They're meant to be more of a strategic forecasting uh, by the intelligence community. So they looked at these two time periods. Look at you know currently out into 2035, and then also much further down the road uh, towards the end of the you know, 21st century and so on. And, and what they highlighted was that there are obviously a lot of uh, events happening uh, globally. A couple of that they just mentioned in this report, and I'll go ahead and share them with you. From This is from the NIE. Uh, this is the unclassified version, obviously. Um, but they highlighted a couple of things that were happening and how climate change was exacerbating security situation in many countries. So for example, Mexico City, Still, still, folks still trying to get in here. So in Mexico City in 2014, um, citizens in the village on the outskirts of Mexico City, already water stressed by drought, battled anti-riot police during a protest over the diversion of spring water to a new development nearby. More than 100 people were injured and many were seriously. Uh, 2014 in Nigeria, farmers and herdsmen clashed over access to grazing land, dwindling well water, uh, President Goodluck Jonathan ordered military operations in to reduce the violence. And then 2012 in um, uh, Mauritania, uh, mass protest and violence erupted over water shortages. Uh, more than 70,000 refugees had migrated to Mauritania in July uh, because of deteriorating conditions in neighboring Mali, putting additional pressure on Mauritania's water and soil resources already strained by drought and de uh, deforestation. So, so again, just they, they highlighted some examples of where we're seeing the effects of this. Uh, on countries that were creating security situations and, and creating internal conflict, in this case, uh, you know, in, in countries in Africa and Latin America. Um, and, and they highlight the fact that we're going to see probably impact on food prices, availability. Uh, as we said, these are some of those, those secondary and tertiary effects, the accelerator effects of how terrorist groups could actually exploit that. An example of that would be in Mali uh, with AQIM, that's Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb. Uh, those terrorist groups have been able to exploit the food shortages and situations. And of course, uh, health effects, uh, extreme weather. I think Europe had some uh, you know, hist historic heat in Europe, uh, caused a lot of deaths uh, because they're not obviously equipped to deal with, uh, with you know, extreme heat in, those, in many of those countries. And also the rise of infectious disease. And, and so many people are concerned that what we're seeing now with, with COVID is just the beginning of, of many more uh, pandemics and other uh, disease-related uh, problems we're facing. This one also talked about that they did bring up the issue about the basin rights and access to infrastructure and so on. Um, and they did address the Arctic region. So that, that was included in, the, in this NIE as well. So for example, they raised issues about changes in, in the sea ice levels. Um, right now, the estimate is about 13% per decade. Um, and that has the impact obviously on wildlife habits. Um, this, I like this one, this is the lone seal picture. Sometimes you've seen you know, the lone polar bear out on the iceberg floating around. I mean, it just kind of emphasizes again, the fact that uh, there is change going on and uh, it does affect the habitat of, of many of the, um, uh, you know, the, um, in this case, the wildlife in those regions. Uh, you're gonna see it affect migration patterns, uh, also how it impacts on people. As I mentioned, particularly in Canada, uh, the impact has been felt mostly by the First Nations, by the Inuit uh, up in the Northern parts of Canada. And, and having, uh, again, loss of hunting grounds, loss of fishing through the commercial competition, others that previously had not been issues uh, because of the, the terrain and because of the, you know, the permafrost and the extension of the ice fields, but that obviously doing the meltings impacting that as well. So, so it did raise these issues again about how climate change is gonna continue to impact particularly the Arctic region. Uh, this came out, this is the document I was mentioning to you. They, I didn't have that WMO and update, but I found this one. This was uh, this came out of a, um, a think tank called Future Earth, but they raised this, uh, this came out in their report uh, last year. And they were talking again about the impact of uh, climate change on the permafrost. And these are regions, uh, particularly like up in Siberia and Northern, uh, Northern Russia, but also up in Canada, about how this is having an abrupt impact in this case of the thawing it's actually creating, in this case, a lot of emissions. We don't realize that there's a lot of gases and things that are created as a result of the melt of permafrost in these regions. And, and as a result, it's impacting root activity, soil respiration, all these things that have kind of a, a very detrimental effect on the environment. And uh, particularly for people living in those areas who are obviously trying to you know, make ends meet and, uh, and, and live in those areas of, of in this case, in, in Northern, again, Northern Alaska, Northern Alaska, Canada, and, and of course in the Soviet, uh, 
former Soviet Union up in Russia now. So this is a, this is kind of this issue of kind of that it's actually increasing as, as again as, as the snow melts, we're actually seeing an increase in more of these greenhouse gas effects, and that's actually accelerating. And that's why some people believe this this you know, idea of abrupt climate change. Uh, is a very real phenomenon. It's just, uh, you know, we were seeing this thing over centuries or decades, uh, but it may get to what we call a peak point where it may actually accelerate much more quickly. And, and that's caused a lot of, you know, obviously concern from, uh, from obviously from a security standpoint and others. And this is just one snapshot. Uh, this gives you an idea again from looking at some uh, satellite imagery from NASA uh, about uh, over about a 30 year period. Uh, and the idea here, again, whenever you see these pictures, always be careful because you want to make sure it's like, you know, how does, you know, the, you know, the time of year and all that factor into it. Because sometimes you'll see some of these pictures that are, again, different times of year. But this was taken, again, September to September. So you're looking at about in the same time frame uh, of how we're seeing, again, a significant impact in polar ice uh, in uh, its extent, but also uh, how it uh, how much it lasts throughout the, you know, throughout the year as well. So, so there obviously is a, a significant degradation in this case of what were consistent, consistently being polar ice fields that would last year round. As far as getting outside the Arctic region, you might have the question, well, how does that impact other parts of the world? Well, the area where it really impacts is on this idea of, of currents. And this is something called the AMOC. It's the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation. Okay, again, I'm not a climatologist. But the point of it is what it's doing is it's actually showing that it's having, as, as polar ice melts, it's having an increased impact on, uh, in this case, the, the currents that run through the, uh, the Atlantic region, the Gulf Stream, North Atlantic, and so on. Uh, and that uh, is showing that it will, by, by 2100, is actually slowing those currents by 25%. The impact there, as you see, we're going to have colder winters. So it seems like this anomaly, wait a minute, global warming, colder... Well, it's due to the currents and the impact on the currents. And as a result, uh, it's gonna affect fishing, uh, the access to fishing. We're seeing, we're seeing migration of different, you know, different species as a result of this. And uh, it also gonna have an impact on, on the extreme weather and looking at it in terms of, of you know, cyclones and you know, uh, hurricanes and so on. And I'll just give an example of that. If uh, you know, in 2020 alone, um, this was the most active um, and this was so the fifth costliest in terms of the uh, in history uh, of what we've had from extreme weather hurricane season. Um, it was the first consecutive um, season where we've had over since 2016, where we increased the amount of named storms every year. Uh, this year we had 30 named storms. As you remember, we we ran out of names for them. We had to go to the Greek alphabet uh, since there were so many. We had uh, 13 major hurricanes or six major hurricanes, uh, 13, and uh, we were basically the second highest on record. Uh, and we even had category five hurricanes this year as well. Uh, the irony is here, here in South Carolina, like, you know, I've lived here now for seven years and this is like the first year we didn't have a major hurricane come through South Carolina. So, so we were very fortunate. Uh, unfortunately, other parts of the country were not like New Orleans and the Gulf Coast region that just got hit repeatedly with, with one after the other. So what are, what are countries competing over? Big areas, resources. Um, and in this case, uh, you know, China and Russia are, are making their stake making a claim to this region uh, because of, again, the access to resources that previously would not have been accessible, uh, particularly one of the big ones is oil. Uh, estimates that there are 90 billion barrels of oil in terms of proven reserves, and uh, 13%, 30% uh, of natural gas deposits, uh, liquefied natural gas being a big commodity that uh, the Russia in particular is, is seeking to exploit. Um, we think about the seafood industry in our own country, in Alaska, and how big an industry that is, and that's how that becomes affected by uh, the changes taking place in the Arctic region. Uh, access to, to minerals, uh, rare earth minerals and others in that region. And then of course the shipping piece we talked about before, access to that Northwest Passage. And that's a big reason why uh, you know, companies want to take advantage of and exploit it because it cuts down on their transit costs. Um, I lived in Panama for three years, you know, Panama Canal, great engineering miracle the United States built you know, under TR. But again, countries are, are moving away from that because it's now more cost effective to actually use the Northwest Passage as opposed to actually going through the Panama Canal. They have to pay a lot of money to use the locks uh, to the Panamanian government now. But, but so we do see these changes taking place. And, and as a result, that's why this has become much more competitive as a region. And in terms of who's investing in the region, Russia has put a lot more money into its icebreaker fleet to make areas more accessible. So uh, they have 37 icebreakers, we have three. And of the three that we have, uh, two are not even working. 
Okay. Uh, the Healy was a medium class uh, Coast Guard cutter, icebreaker uh, that uh, had a fire. And so that's not been in use uh, for, for a while. Um, Polar Sea is the other, the large, the heavy uh, cutter. Uh, that's not been operated. That's been cannibalized to keep the one cutter, uh, the Polar Star, actually running. And that's actually been used in an Antarctica. Uh, it's fascinating. My, my dad was in the Coast Guard and, uh, and did Arctic duty uh, aboard ice, uh, icebreakers. And um, they would actually take a year's worth of food on an icebreaker uh, simply because they might get trapped in, in ice and, and not be able to leave. And so, uh, so countries like Russia have invested much more in that, uh, in that capability up in, in the Arctic region uh, compared to the United States. Now, the Trump administration did put more funding into uh, new icebreakers and replacing those. I'll talk about those a little later. So first off, let's let's talk about interest. Uh, what are Russia's interests? Um, mostly economic, but also security. Uh, as you can see in the map, they have a large number of their military bases scattered throughout uh, the northern part of the country. Uh, a lot of that is on that Kola Peninsula, which is right off of Norway, uh, where Murmansk is located. That's two thirds of their what we call the strategic deterrent forces are in that region. So they're very concerned from a security standpoint. Uh, these are much more accessible now. Uh, whereas those would have been protected by polar ice and it'd be very difficult, obviously, to invade or to have access to that as the ice melts, they be, those facilities become much more vulnerable. So there is obviously a, concern, a security concern uh, that, uh, that they would have. Uh, there's a remilitarization concern of that taking place in the region. They're concerned about what we're doing. And we look at it like, what do you mean? A Keflavik, you know, ice station? I mean, a Keflavik, uh, Thule Air Force Base. I mean, we really don't have large uh, military uh, deployments up in the Arctic. But we did uh, reopen uh, uh, Keflavik. We did actually put the uh, U.S. Um, uh, more naval assets up in, in that area. So that is a change. And so they raised that as one of their concerns about why, you know, they have to take more actions because the United States is taking more action to be present in that region. Don't neglect China. Uh, China is not an Arctic country um, because it is not in the Arctic Circle. It's not part of the Arctic Council. But they consider themselves a near Arctic state, meaning they have economic interests in the region and they are investing heavily into uh, into uh, commercial efforts, uh, just again, particularly transiting through that region. Um, so China has, uh, again, they're, they're part of that observer group um, and they see it part of what they call the Polar Silk Road. This is, this is tied to China's larger what's called the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, that they're pursuing globally. And, and Richard's going to talk quite a bit about that with China and in Africa with his talk. Uh, they have invested heavily in Greenland. They have a free trade agreement with Iceland. And the big concern is, will they actually try to base military forces up in the Arctic region like they've done uh, in the Red Sea region? If you remember Ambassador Shin's talk a couple of years, uh, last year, uh, he talked specifically about how the Chinese military, and this is the, you know, the PLA, the People's Liberation Army Navy, uh, is uh, is uh, now in Djibouti uh, in, in the, uh, on the Red Sea, primarily to protect their commercial interest and their economic interest in the region. Could they do the same thing in the Arctic? Could they make an argument for that? There's a big issue about, remember, artificial islands that China is building uh, and claiming territorial sea around those islands. So possibly the Arctic could be another area where they would uh, be, uh, be interested in um, investing. And, and you can understand from an economic standpoint, just for example, uh, China, uh, 10 million tons of goods uh, went through the Northern Sea Passage in 2017, and 40% of, of any uh, commercial products that transited the Arctic, 40% either came from China and originated in a Chinese port or were going to China. So they have a very large economic interest in the Arctic region, and you can see why uh, these might be a concern uh, in this case for, um, for, the, um, you know, for other countries in that region. Um, they have had six uh, expeditions up in the Arctic recently. And uh, one of the biggest concerns we have is that uh, they're actually maybe doing some joint operations with the Russians up in the Arctic uh, in this area. Let's not forget Canada. Uh, Canada has, uh, you know, the, the, compared, next to Russia, Canada has the most area that borders on the Arctic. Uh, they are very concerned about what's happening, this uh, loss of sovereignty. They don't want this area to be treated as a NATO issue simply because they're concerned uh, when you look at the, the, in this case, the Northwest Passage areas between the islands and all that, they don't want it to be a NATO issue for security. They see it as a sovereignty issue for, from Canada's perspective. They call those internal waters. And so as a result, they don't want to uh, elevate this into a, into a NATO issue. But they are very concerned about protecting their country's borders and protecting their national sovereignty. Um, Canada's got a very small military force. Um, they, uh, you know, it's about 60,000 total. 
uh, all services combined. Um, they do intercept Russian bombers when they fly across or close to their territorial areas. Uh, they've got 77 CF-18s, uh, which are the Canadian version of RF-18s. Uh, but they, they, uh, they're, they're concerned about, again, the, the threat that they're facing. Russia has 1,300 uh, strategic fighters that they could use in this area. Uh, they also have 181 bombers that uh, are in that area. They, they talk about purchasing the F-35 to increase their air interdiction capability, but there's problems with the F-35 on um, the ability to operate in extreme weather, particularly extreme cold. So, so that may not necessarily be an option. They did try to purchase this vehicle on the bottom down there. That is a, it's an MTV, it's called a marginal terrain vehicle. Uh, in uh, 2014, they were going to purchase 17 of these to have greater access to the Arctic in the Arctic region, but uh, the, uh, the parliament uh, didn't approve it. They, they lost funding for it, 60 million in funding, and they also cut 3 billion in, in, uh, in Canada's defense spending. So this is a real concern for our northern neighbors. Uh, the Arctic is an area of, of, of a very real uh, concern and interest for them. Now, our areas, uh, I know I'm, I'm getting a little long here. Let me try to wrap up here. Our area, obviously, concern is uh, where, you know, U.S. has access because we are an Arctic country with, uh, with Alaska. And you can see where this is areas where the United States has, has been trying to uh, recognize that this is a concern to us from a strategic uh, security standpoint. The problem, again, I mentioned is that we are not signatory to that law of the sea treaty. And that leaves us out of a lot of the negotiations that are taking place on that. Um, Russian leadership occurring in that. Um, I did wanna highlight this picture that you see down here. That's, that's a Russian flag. Uh, that was actually planted uh, at the bottom of the Arctic Sea, right below uh, the North Pole. It was basically Russia making a statement that we're claiming this territory as part of Russia. So, so we are concerned about Russian activity in that area. This is resurgent naval and air activity. And then also this, com, this, co, you know, com, um, this cooperation that's taking place between them. There actually was a, an exercise that just took place last year in 2020 off of Alaska in the Bering Sea uh, that was in the US uh, exclusive economic zone. Fishermen were caught completely off guard. They contacted the Coast Guard saying, are we under an attack? Are we being invaded? Because they saw these Russian military uh, ships and also uh, Chinese. And the Coast Guard basically said, just do what they say, because they were telling them to get out of their way, avoid us, stay away from us and all that other stuff. So it is obviously a concern about uh, their increased cooperation in that region. Now, we've, we've had a number of different policies. Uh, the Bush administration put this out in, in a Homeland Security Policy Directive uh, towards the Arctic under Homeland Security. So they did recognize this an area of concern. Uh, the Obama administration put it into their national security strategy in 2010, where it did say that the Arctic you know, was an Arctic nation. We do have security in that region. Under Trump in 2017, there's only one reference to the Arctic in, in this case, the national security strategy uh, of the Trump administration. And I'll go ahead and read that for you. Uh, this is all it says about the Arctic in that. It says, um, there's a range of international institutions establishes the rules for how states, businesses, and individuals interact with each other across land and sea, the Arctic, outer space, and digital realm. Again, it's just, just kind of a blanket statement did not really address the Arctic as a region of concern or for security concerns for the country. Um, and as we saw that with the policy, uh, basically it was uh, deny climate change. Uh, they, the Arctic Council met in 2019. They couldn't come up with a joint re resolution at the end of that meeting because uh, the United States refused to allow language in there referring to global warming. Um, Trump has posed, you know, the, we obviously know the ANWR and the desire to, to access, uh, you know, oil fields up in the uh, the National Wildlife Refugee, up, uh, Refugee in Alaska. And then, of course, the really bizarre one was uh, when President Trump offered to, to buy Greenland, um, which, uh, as you can imagine, didn't go over very well with, with the, you know, the, the Danes because uh, that's part of their kingdom is Greenland's part. Of, and, of course, the you know, people in Greenland didn't, uh, didn't like that as well. So... But other things are happening. Uh, the DOD and the uh, U.S. Coast Guard actually have put out Arctic security strategies. Uh, so they are aware of that. They're building awareness. They're trying to enhance more Arctic operations and strengthen uh, more of their access to the region. Looking at it as a shared region, doing cooperation, doing, um, in this case, uh, joint exercise together. And they see it as a potential corridor for the strategic competition. Uh, as I mentioned, the Trump administration is purchasing two, at least two new uh, heavy, in this case, heavy uh, cutters. And you see the uh, prototype of those. There's, they're going to be built down in Pascagoula in Mississippi. So, so there is a recognition we need to increase our, our, uh, our, our icebreaker uh, capabilities up there. We have been able to put medium class. That's uh, the uh, Tahoma is a 270-foot endurance class cutter. The Coast Guard just recently uh, did an exercise north of the Arctic Circle. 
the Navy just put this out. This was something I just found literally yesterday as I was putting you know, the last touches on the brief. Uh, the Navy is now published. This actually just came out uh, in, in January uh, to publish a new strategic blueprint for the Arctic. And that's a recognition that this is an area that's going from white to blue, meaning it's more accessible. The Navy has to increase their presence and be able to access parts of, of the Arctic as well. Uh, Homeland Security. They put out a, a, a strategy literally on the, the waning days of the Trump administration um, to recognize that this is an area of concern. And of course, home, Coast Guard is part of Homeland Security. So a big part of the Coast Guard mission looking at that uh, to strengthen re, you know, resilience, cooperation, things like that. Note the date that it was signed. It was signed on January 11, 2021 by Chad Wolf, the acting secretary of Homeland Security. It was the day he resigned. OK, so again, whether this continues or not, it's kind of like a last minute effort. These things have been worked on, but the problem is there's been such opposition within the Trump administration to be able to put former strat and you know, put forth these, uh, these particular doctrines and strategies. One thing I want to highlight, and, I'm, and I will stop with this, um, new relations with Greenland. Um, we reopened our consulate in Nuuk. This was in uh, 2020. Um, we've had limited direct security cooperation with Greenland because they are part of Denmark and we didn't want to you know, upset the Danes and all that. But we had this joint operation Nanook. It was a search and rescue exercise in 2020. U.S., Denmark, France, and Canada participated. And it was those two cutters, the Tahoma and the Campbell. But I did want to share this kind of an interesting little aside. Um, one of the uh, seamen who was on up there for the deployment, um, she actually uh, went to a restaurant one night, uh, was eating out in Nuuk, saw this man sitting there by himself. Uh, and she just said, you know, I'm just going to buy dinner for him. Uh, that's something we do, random acts of kindness. People have done that for me, being in the military, being a service member. And she went up and, and offered to do that. And the guy came up to her and said, well, why did you do that? And she just tried to explain all that. He goes, do you know who I am? And she's like, no, I have no clue. He goes, I'm the prime minister of Greenland, okay? And he just happened to be fishing and came in from fishing that day. Uh, and so long story short is that uh, she opened doors of communication uh, invited him to the ship. He met the commander. They took a tour. He invited him to their operations center, which we had never had access to before. And uh, it was just kind of like one of these kind of neat little happenstance things. Uh, they published a story about it on Stripes and all that. Uh, I, I have to brag about it because the, the, the seaman's my daughter. Okay, that's Katie Kilroy. Uh, she was on that cruise. Uh, she's the one who actually did the inroads and had the, um, uh, made the inroads with the, uh, with the prime minister. And uh, so anyway, it was just kind of an exciting thing that happened as a result of, of this particular deployment. So just to kind of wrap things up, um, Biden strategy, we're trying to figure out where the Biden administration is going to go. Uh, it's a little early to see, but there are some indicators that uh, we will see some changes. One of them being on the executive order that uh, the Biden administration put out. Uh, this uh, was signed just recently. It said, the Secretary of Homeland Security shall consider the implications of climate change in the Arctic along our nation's borders and to national critical functions, including any relevant information from the climate risk analysis. So, so we do see a recognition under the Biden administration, uh, desire to re-enter the Paris Agreement. Again, Department of Defense looking at concerns. They're, they've been uh, you know, told to look at the impact in this case of, of a warming world. Uh, he's also directed the ODNI to produce a new NIE uh, on, uh, on climate change and national security. And we see them, uh, again, recognition that the, the Obamas uh, claim that the climate change is an existential threat. So I think the end result is we will see more multilateral approaches towards the Arctic, in particular, Arctic security. And so I leave you with this. I don't have time to show the video clip, but um, some of you remember, maybe remember this. Are we going to go back to the Cold War? This is, is it going to be strategic competition. Uh, there was a movie that came out in 1968 you might have seen called Ice Station Zebra. Uh, just click on... Uh, uh, if, if, you, if you pull up the website or there, you can see the trailer for the movie and it, it kind of talks about, you know, maybe we're going back to the future where we were during the Cold War in terms of strategic competition in the Arctic region. So that went a little long. I apologize for that. Let me go ahead and stop sharing and I'll take a look and see what, see what questions we have here in, uh, in the session. So. Okay, um, so I got a question from Sammy. Uh, it says, what U.S. agencies are responsible for security threats resulting from easier access to the Arctic Sea? Um, well, again, from, from a U.S. standpoint, um, the, the military command this comes under is, is Northern Command uh, because it is part of the contiguous, you know, the, the lower 48 and Alaska. They, they are part of uh, U.S. Northern Command's area of responsibility now. Canada used to be unassigned. Uh, before 9-11, we really didn't have a combatant command that looked at that region. So from a DOD standpoint, it came under um, 
you know, a lot of it was related to NATO relations that we had with the region, with the North Atlantic, all that. But now it comes under NORTHCOM and those those remaining dew line stations, those air, uh, the uh, radar sites we have up there are now under space command. <laughs> Uh, the new uh, the new military service that we have now, Air, the Air Force, uh, you, not Air Force, it's called, you know, Space, Space Force. So those are now coming under Space Force, uh, which uh, NORAD is now coming part of as well. So there's kind of a change in how the uh, Department of Defense looks at those particular areas. Homeland Security has concern because of the Coast Guard. Uh, that's air area of responsibility. Uh, but really the, the idea, do we, do we have like a, an agency that just focuses on the Arctic? We don't really have that. And that's what's lacking, as I would say, is this idea of a whole of government approach towards the Arctic. As I mentioned to you, we have strategies coming out of the Coast Guard, uh, DHS, Navy, Marines, but we don't have it yet in a national security strategy. That's what we really need is a, a, a national security strategy that takes a whole of government approach on how all agencies are going to be focusing on the Arctic. And an example of that being the State Department, like I said, when, when my daughter reached out to the prime minister and wanted to open door, they had to go to the State Department and says, can we do this? Can we even talk to these people? Um, and they got the, because we had a consulate now in Nuke, they had this, you know, the State Department rep got involved in this. And so suddenly it opened some doors for, uh, you know, collaboration in terms of diplomacy and stuff like that. So I think that's the key is, you know, what, why, you know, why don't we have this kind of a, kind of a, in this case, a national level strategy to get all the U.S. government agencies to cooperate together. Um, let's see, Mr. Farley, why don't we join the UNCLOS Treaty? Um, a little bit of history on that. The, the main reason we did not join it back in the 70s and 80s, is because again, it was seen as part of this, this North-South debate. And the North-South debate was always, you know, rich countries versus poor countries. And uh, the U.S. did not sign it because one of the conditions being pushed by the developing countries, the South, uh, was that um, the, the, the Western, the developed countries uh, needed to provide technology to, in this case, resources you know, in the seabeds. Uh, the big issue back then was something called manganese nodules. Uh, manganese nodules were a commodity that could be harvested off the seabed, uh, and uh, they had a lot of, you know, mineral wealth associated with it. Well, there were only a couple countries, and we being the most dominant one, that could actually do that. And so part of the condition was if we signed on to the treaty, it was going to be this big transfer of wealth, this idea that this would be an idea, you know, for the, the developing countries, you know, to be able to be provided for by the developing countries. So, so there's really kind of a lot of pushback on that from that standpoint. That's not so much the concern today. I think the concern today, again, is it has to go into, you know, as a result of that, are we losing more access and ability to influence these discussions on uh, issues like Arctic and uh, in this case, uh, you know, the inclusive economic zones, because we're not a member of it. I don't know, again, what the holdups are in particular specific issues still to this day, but, uh, but again, something comes up like every presidential administration kind of revisits it, but never actually makes a commitment. And maybe us by rejoining, you know, maybe the Paris Accords, the Paris Agreement, others might actually uh, allow that to take place finally. Okay, let me see what else we got here. Um, yeah, the 2009 map, polar map appeared to show most of the melt off the coast of Russia. Um, I don't, I, again, I'm not a climatologist, so I, I don't know if there's a specific region for a reason for that. I, I do know that that area in Russia is much more developed, meaning that, again, you have a number of those military bases, you have an economic activity, you have larger cities than you have on Canada's side. The Canadian U.S. side don't have a lot of that human activity going on. So, so there may be a contribution just because the fact is that you have more human development, more activity going on, you know, on, on the, the northern part of Siberia up there in the Russian area. Uh, do you have a concern we're headed towards World War II or back to the future? Yeah, you know, I, I kind of put that jokingly in at the at the end of the at the presentation, but there are people who are obviously raising that concern because of Russia's uh, and China in particular. They're just becoming much more militant uh, in terms of pushing their access to the region and challenging the United States. In some cases, it's uh, the idea: if you have a void, you know, what's going to fill the void? Uh, well, Russia is obviously the one most equipped to do that. Uh, the, the Norway, Sweden, a lot of our, you know, our, our allies in that region are concerned about that. Uh, there was a, a couple of years ago, there was this issue. One, a Russian submarine had actually gone into Sweden's territorial waters to, to kind of see how close they could get. Uh, the Swedes got all upset. And, you know, the you know, next thing you can expect, you know, depth charges being dropped off of Swedish destroyers and all that. But, but there is a potential that it could escalate or there could be an accidental confrontation in that region. And that's when uh, the, 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 the recent exercise with China and, uh, and Russia over in the Bering Sea off of Alaska, 
we did not even know about that. When the Coast Guard found out about it, they were like, oh, wow, okay, yeah, this is this is not good. So a lot of it is just increasing the, the communication channels. And that's what the Arctic Council is meant to do is facilitate communication to prevent the possibility of a, of a confrontation that could escalate into something more serious later on. And so I think that's, uh, you know, People are saying don't you know, don't use the World War. I mean the again the Cold War rhetoric, all that because we it could be kind of a self propagating uh, in this case uh, activity. But it, it is obviously an area of concern that again what's being exacerbated again by the uh, by the onset of, of, of the climate change issues. Yeah, I mean Sammy, on, on, as far as the threats go, again I think this is an area that um, because we've not had a lot of uh, the, the last four years have not really focused on the Arctic region, um, and I simply think that's been um, to our own detriment because of it. Um, and I think you see something similar here to what, you know, the issue with the, the red, uh, in this case, the South China Sea is that, you know, that China went in and built these artificial reefs and artificial islands. And as a result, what they did was they tried to extend their territorial waters to keep out the United States. Um, and the United States has always uh, promoted what we call FONOPS, uh, Freedom of Navigation Operations. And that's why uh, we, we, we go into the Gulf of Sidra up off of Libya. Uh, Qaddafi tried to cut it off and say, no, you can't go in there. And the U.S. says, you know, it says yeah, we can. And so uh, I think you're seeing something similar to that in the South China Sea. The question is, could that happen up in the Arctic? Um, there is one area off of uh, Norway. There, there is a contested archipelago up there. The Salvad archipelago is, is claimed by Norway. Uh, Russia has tried to claim that too. And the idea is if they are able to claim it, they would then try to extend their territorial sea out, which would affect this um, used to be called the uh, the GIUK gap during the Cold War. It was how Russian submarines would actually get out of Murmansk and transit down into the Atlantic would come through this GIUK corridor. And we had something called the SONAR system back then. It was an underwater you know, sonar system to be able to track movement of submarines and all that. The problem is that if, if, the, if these territorial sea uh, extensions take place, the continental shelf claims and so on, it's gonna make freedom of navigation uh, much more difficult as they claim more ownership over those territories. And that, that is a concern for us. So, oh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we're, we're excited about her service too. We're really appreciative of that. Um, she's, uh, she's trying to be a public affairs specialist. Uh, she got invited to go on this, these cruises. And so she actually was on both ships. So she was up there for like 60 some odd days as part of both deployments. So um, she's actually stationed out of Portsmouth right now, uh, part of Atlantic Area Command. Uh, so, uh, so we're, we're, we're happy for her that she's following in her grandfather's footsteps since, uh, I didn't join the Coast Guard, but she did. So good. Are there any, anything else? No. Okay. Well, again, thank you everybody for participating. Uh, I think this is great. We had a good start to the program. Uh, the, the size of the program is good. Um, like I said, if, if we can accommodate uh, more interaction, uh, maybe in the future we will. Uh, I know it's, it's, um, Kind of hard because you, you know, when you start adding people and allowing people to speak, it, it can become a little cumbersome at times, uh, like with our, our programs that we run in Johnson. Uh, but uh, but we'll, we'll see how the, the future sessions go. Uh, but the good thing is that, uh, again, we uh, were able to, the technology held out for us, and uh, hopefully everybody didn't uh, got, got, got to see the presentation. So good. Okay. Well, thank you all. Everybody have a, a good weekend. Okay. Take care.